I should probably thank Lewis first, who works here at Cultaholic, who said, Jack, you know that new series you're doing? Is that just going to be limited to greatest wrestlers, or are you going to expand it into stuff like tag teams, for example? Um, so here we are. So last week saw the creation of MJF's new stable, The Pinnacle. Uh, and it's looking pretty good, guys. And it's looking good because you've got all the different elements, haven't you? You've got young Maxwell himself, the leader. You've got Tully Blanchard, the brains. You've got the brawn of Wardlow. Uh, and you've got Sean Spears, who likes to hit people with a chair. But I think the element that I'm most excited about is Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler, AKA FTR. And the reason that I find them so compelling is because despite only teaming regularly about six years ago for the first time, and despite still being very much active today, I firmly believe that they are one of the greatest tag teams in all of wrestling history. And now I'm going to explain exactly why. When it comes to FTR, or whatever you want to call them, The Revival, or Dash and Dawson, uh, there's always one stereotype, isn't there, that kind of rings true a lot of the time, or seems to, but hopefully it's a stereotype that I'll challenge a little bit later on. However, it is partly true, and that is, they're not flashy, but they have incredibly solid fundamentals. No flips, just fists. So, fundamentals is exactly where we're going to start. That is reason number one. And when I say fundamentals, I don't just mean mechanical fundamentals in the ring. Wait, they used to be called the mechanics jokes. Uh, because I'm not just talking about punches, kicks, running the ropes, selling, bumping, all that sort of stuff. Anybody can watch a match featuring either member of FTR and see what an incredibly solid, well-rounded professional wrestler both of them are. When I say fundamentals, I also mean tag team fundamentals, things that make up the very fabric of tag team wrestling and the fact that FTR excel at those things. Things like creating an incredible match structure or controlling the ebb and flow of the crowd's emotions, controlling the pace of a match, getting together and working together to make things better. It's a simple message, just one for the Arthur fans out there. And to explain just how good they are at these tag team fundamentals, I'm not going to be choosing one of their super like five star fan favorite elite level matches, although we will get to those later on in this video. I'm instead going to choose a match that was still a very, very good tag team match, but one that had quite a simple plan behind it and that is the revival or the mechanics I believe they were then known as versus Enzo and Cass at NXT TakeOver London. The makeup of this match has all the ingredients for uh, a very simple but uh, a very excellent at the same time tag team dynamic because you've got the heel tag team and then you've got their opponents one of whom is talkative but smaller the guy they want to isolate and try and dominate and cut off from his partner because his partner is gigantic uh, and likes to wreck house. And that's what we get to one of the tag team fundamentals that FTR or the mechanics or the revival really really excel at which is the heat segment. Heat segments are often thought of as the boring part of a match especially a tag team match because it's just two guys isolating the weaker of their two opponents from the other and not letting him make that hot tag and everybody's waiting for the hot tag so you almost sometimes want to fast forward until you get to the hot tag but the, the point of the heat segment is to build the tension and make us wait for it and almost make us earn that hot hot tag as an audience. And the reason that FTR are so good at that is because it's not a boring heat segment. A lot of wrestlers do fall into the trap of making their heat segments a little bit boring. A lot of chin locks, a lot of rest holds. Not when it comes to FTR. Both of them are excellent at really grinding down on those headlocks and that sort of thing, uh, using a bit of unique double team maneuvering, doing stuff behind the referee's back. You can't really take your eyes off an FTR heat segment as you could with perhaps many, many other tag teams. They're also incredibly good at the fake hot tag where you really do think that the baby faces are finally gonna make that big switch and then they take it away from you at the last second. There's an example of that in this TakeOver London match where it looks like Enzo is just about to make the tag, so then uh, Dawson calls Dash into the ring, he charges across and knocks Big Cass off the apron. And just as the crowd are coming up and they're like, it's gonna finally happen, it's just snatched away at the last second. The purpose of that isn't just to annoy the crowd, uh, it's to make the eventual hot tag when it happens all the more exciting. And when it does happen, of course, they bump like absolute warriors for Big Cass. There's also, of course, the more famous older brother of the fake hot tag sequence, which is, of course, the near fall. And there's an excellent example of a near fall in this one, uh, really giving the crowd hope before snatching it away for maximum drama. Enzo and Cass have just hit their double team finisher, and then Enzo gets yanked out of the ring at the very last second. 
second. And then to capitalize on the crowd's fury, they start getting into it with Carmella on the outside as well. Uh, so we already hate them for that near fall, and now we hate them even more for picking on somebody not even involved in the match. So that match, which of course they win in the end, uh, is a great example of FTR playing the heel role in what you might call a very standard tag team match, but taking it to near perfection, the formula that, they, that they've excelled at. Um, but I don't think that they're a one-trick pony, even if it is a damn good trick. That's because FTR are very able to tailor their game to the circumstances required. They're not necessarily just a heel tag team who cut off one opponent and keep him away from the hot tag. And that's where we get to point number two in this video, their adaptability. I'm now going to talk about two different feuds that they had uh, after beating Enzo and Cass. So once that feud was over, they ditched the mechanics name, they became the revival, and they came up against American Alpha. Remember American Alpha? God, I miss American Alpha. And the key difference here is that their opponents are not a standard big man, little man combination, or they're not a standard... There's no Ricky Morton in that team. Yes, Jason Jordan and Chad Gable are kind of a big and little combination, but neither man is the Ricky Morton, neither man is always reaching for the hot tag, neither man is necessarily the face in peril. Both guys can do a hot tag and absolutely run wild. And in kayfabe terms, they're both stronger than the Revival, aren't they? They're both more skilled, they're both more ferocious. It's just the Revival's teamwork and sneakiness that keeps them in the conversation in these matches. So this unique dynamic allows for a much more advanced format than the match we saw at TakeOver London. That's where we get to uh, one of the, I think, three excellent tag team matches between American Alpha and the Revival, and we're heading to NXT TakeOver Dallas. This is the one where the Revival dropped those belts and American Alpha had the big happy win. In this match, the Revival are on the back foot more than we are normally used to seeing them. Uh, that's because their opponents are so talented, and that's really hammered home by Scott Dawson and really struggling against Chad Gable in those opening exchanges because Chad Gable is an Olympic level amateur wrestler and Dawson's out of his depth and they make that really obvious it's really entertaining so the story then becomes with the revival firmly on the back foot about them having to dig deeper into their usual book of tricks uh, and be a bit more innovative to gain the upper hand the perfect example here is uh, Dash doing his now infamous trick he's used it many times since where he crawls under the ring out the other side and cuts off the hot tag uh, it adds a little bit of an element of of surprise not only for his opponent in kayfabe terms but in reality it, it adds a huge element of surprise for the live crowd who are just absolutely furious so of course when the hot tag finally is made jason jordan is an absolute house on fire he's throwing them all over the place again they are bumping like madmen for him he pulls the straps down it's all the momentum is totally gone in american alpha's favor and that forces the revival to go even more sneaky even more devious uh, with things such as the desperation uh, illegal bottom rope level Leveragey pinfall kind of thing with with Dash helping Dawson with his like the towel over the feet on the outside. You'll see, oh, and I'm sure he's thrown up a picture there to describe it far better than than I could. So we go from London, where the revival are pretty much dominant and controlling the action, to Dallas, where they are outmatched completely by a pair of more naturally gifted opponents. But they're in there because of their teamwork, because of their heelishness. Ultimately, though, it doesn't matter because American Alpha pick up the big win, and everybody is just. So buzzing. Fast forward to our next feud, three and a half years, uh, the Revival had gone up to the main roster and not really met the success that I believe they deserved. The booking was weird, uh, and that's why everybody was so happy when they stopped by NXT again very briefly for a match with Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish the Undisputed Era. And again, this is a great example of their adaptability to fit the situation, because in this match, the Revival were de facto babyfaces, and they look almost embarrassed about it. There's a very sheepish entrance between the two guys, as the crowd that used to boo them each and every week is suddenly delighted to have them back. And the Revival totally switch up their usual game plan in the opening stages of this match. They're, they're not here to control the action, they're here to have a fight. And there's a big brawl to kick things off, the action spills to the outside, the Undisputed Era want no part of the Revival. They're fully in the babyface role now. To really hammer home this change, this perhaps one-off change in this match, uh, Dash is the face in peril for a long while while his opponents control him, and then he escapes them to make the hot tag with a Hurricane Rana of all things, a very nice one as well, showing that perhaps the Revival have a bit of athleticism that they don't show off at times, or a bit of I guess, acrobatics, that they keep a little secret for themselves to bust out on rare occasions. And of course, Dawson makes the hot tag and runs absolutely wild, like any good babyface should. And he's really good at it, which is so weird for basically a career heel. He even does the old Dusty Rhodes or Bubba Ray Dudley, like the few jabs and then the big right. He skips all the theatrics before the big right, 
but I appreciate the effort. He nails a big leaping kick as well, and then he fires up the crowd. He's, he's firing up the crowd. This is Scott Dawson of The Revival. Towards the end, there's a very compelling exchange of double team moves and reversals and counters, which really solidifies the message that we are seeing two tag teams that know each other absolutely inside out and can work together so seamlessly. But it's the, it's the newer, fresher tag team, the Undisputed Era, who get the win. And it's a big, big loss for the Revival. I wouldn't say it's the biggest loss of their career, though, because we're going to talk about that right now. Yes, we are on to point number three. Uh, their elite level, and I really want to stress that, their elite level match structure. So at the start of this video, obviously I talked about a simple match structure and about how the lads really excel at that and do better than pretty much anybody around today. But I think where they really excel and where their brilliance really shines through is when they have got a complex match structure. That's when things start to get to a bit of a crazy level. In fact, when it comes to constructing a, just an epic feeling match, for me, FTR or The Revival are up there with anybody else in the world. Any single star who's had a huge New Japan main event, the likes of Okada, Omega, Naito, Ibushi, Nakamura, AJ Styles, Kenny Omega, they are up there with all of those guys, in my opinion. And the reason that I mention a lot of those big, epic New Japan names of the past and recent present is because when FTR's matches enter that final third, they really do take on the feel a lot of the time of an epic New Japan five-star main event match. Both Dax and Cash have talked a lot, both in storyline and out of storyline, about how they want to give tag team wrestling the respect that it deserves. And honestly, on evidence, I think they have done a hell of a lot for it in their careers so far. They've kind of delivered on their mission statement. For this segment, I'm only going to focus on one match, but what a match it is. I mean, you could look at any interaction, really, between The Revival and DIY, Gargano and Ciampa, to kind of demonstrate what I'm saying here. But of course, I'm going to focus on their epic clash at NXT TakeOver Toronto in two out of three falls action. It's one of the best tag matches of all time, in my opinion. It might be one of my favorite matches of all time. Not just tag matches. It might be one of my favorite wrestling matches Ever. And one of the reasons for that, and the reason that the match structure here is so elite level, which is the very point that I'm talking about, is because it doesn't just have the usual tropes we expect from a revival tag team match at this stage of their careers. It also has a bit of an unconventional structure at times, designed to throw us off and surprise us and make us think, well, what on earth is going to happen next? The first and most simple example of that, I suppose, is the first fall, because this is two out of three falls, of course, and the revival pick up the first fall within like five minutes. Gargano makes a bit of a mistake, they catch him with the shadow machine, and immediately, I think earlier than anybody expected, it's 1-0 to the Revival. This match is also a great example of a trope that uh, the Revival love to sprinkle into their matches around this time, but this match might be the ultimate example of it. And again, it takes us by surprise every time it happens. It's the referee catching their cheating or their, their cheating ways somehow being foiled. So two examples I can think of in this match, you've got Dash doing his under the ring trick to cut off the hot tag again, but this time Champ is ready for it, catches him and just kicks him away. Later on, they go for a handful of tights and the referee catches it, but the pace has been so fast and furious up until that point, you don't really expect it to happen. You just think, oh no, the match is going to be over because the scores are level by this point. Instead, the ref catches it and everybody breathes a huge sigh of relief. It's not even a sigh of relief. It's more of like a cheer of relief because they've built it so well up until that point. That's a great example of a near fall. And I think this match is really peppered with excellent examples of near falls done in, again, a bit of a surprising or unconventional way that really elevates how well this match is structured. One example would be when Dash distracts the ref during a hot tag, so Ciampa tries to get in the ring, the ref's not having any of it, that isolates Gargano, they nail him with the heart attack, and that for all the world seems like the finish. They're in heart foundation gear, they're in Canada, and Gargano kicks out. Um, that's a great uh, use of circumstantial evidence, I suppose, to really sell the crowd on an ending. Later on, they go the other way with a, with a heart-stopping babyface near fall, and again, this comes later in the match when the scores are tied at 1-1. So we think this could be the ending with uh, with the revival going to steal DIY's meet in the middle finisher but then you know they hit each other by accident and then get nailed with their own finisher the shadow machine and everybody loses their minds but again it's just a near fall and again that seemed for all the world you'd put your house on that being the finish of the match. And of course we have the finish, which isn't quite as sudden. It's not as, as snappy a moment as those previous near falls, but it is perfect in terms of storytelling. Everything's come to this point for the revival. They are caught in stereo submissions, and these two men who always have an escape, always have a dirty trick up their sleeve, are suddenly stuck together in the middle of the ring with nowhere to go. All they have is each other. They grab each other's hands to try and stop a submission, but in the end it's too much. 
They've got no escape. They've got a Gargano escape. Oh, I was doing quite well up until that point. But yeah, the point is they've got nowhere to go. They tap out and it's kind of poetic in a way. It's kind of sad or it would be sad if you didn't desperately want them to lose this match. Exciting wrestling matches, or just generally exciting things in life, are often described as a roller coaster. Uh, I think that's a particularly apt description when it comes to these sort of matches and, and the way that the revivals structure these matches, because if you compare it literally to the roller coaster example, roller coasters often take us by surprise. There's a twist and a turn once you've already done the big loop and you think it's over or, or whatever. There's, this is a terrible description of roller coasters. You know what I mean? They're surprising. You don't know what's going to happen if it's your first time riding it. And that's exactly what FTR or the Revival try to do in this match. Uh, changing up the structure a little bit, building a tag team match which lived up to our very high expectations given the quality of the two teams, but one which also challenges our expectations too. A lot of things happen in that match that I don't think anybody could have predicted going in. I think a key word when it comes to FTR is innovation, but they're not all about innovation, they blend it in. So this is where we get to our fourth point, their, their mixing of old and new. FTR obviously wear their, their influences on their sleeves very much. They make it very obvious that they are paying tribute to great tag teams of the past. We saw it in the last match with the Hart Foundation inspired gear, of course, but there are so many others they could be compared to. I think one tag team that they are often most appropriately compared to is the Brainbusters, Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard. Of course, now they are with Tully Blanchard, so that's really cool. Um, they've got the same grinding, punishing offense, big crunching double team moves, incredibly solid fundamentals, and tactics, strategy. Both of those teams wrestle a match as if it was real. If wrestling was totally legitimate, this is kind of how two guys would go about trying to win it. You know, there's a real thought process to what they're doing in there. But it's an evil thought process because they're heels, which is, which is cool as well. And of course, I think another tag team they can also be compared to is the archetypal heel tag team of wrestling history, the Midnight Express. You watch any Midnight Express classic with the likes of the Rock and Roll Express, and you'll see so many of the shared little tricks that both teams do to get the crowd really angry, to draw heat essentially. We've already talked about a lot of them in this video, but a lot of those things were pioneered by the Midnight Express or really perfected by them. And I think that FTR do a great job of paying tribute to that while also putting a bit of a modern spin on things. And that's because as much as they'd like us to think so, they are not totally a throwback. Um, they are very innovative indeed. And they find themselves in situations where usually you wouldn't find one of these classic tag teams. FTR get thrown or the Revival get thrown into these crazy modern situations quite a lot of the time. And they absolutely continue to thrive there. Let's now take a look at their NXT take over Orlando match, which was a three-way tag team match against DIY and the Authors of Pain. God, remember the AOP? First American Alpha and now the AOP. What has happened? Now this match has a very unique dynamic, maybe the most unique of any match in the Revival's career, both up until that point and since. You've obviously got three tag teams, which is a little bit unusual, but also you've got the use of tables in this match, which is unusual for the Revival. Uh, and also you've got this dynamic where there's two teams that are bitter enemies, they hate each other, but they kind of have to try and work together to take down these massive monsters. This leads to some very inventive spots. There's the moment where all of them team up to put one of the Authors of Pain through a table. Uh, there's the moment where there's a double submission applied by one member of FTR and one member of DIY while the other two members cheer them on openly in the middle of the ring. And there's the combined finishers as well. There's, there's a meet in the middle done by one member of each team. There's a shadow machine done by one member of each team immediately afterwards. The crowd at this point reached like an absolute fever pitch because this is what we've all been sort of dreaming of subconsciously. And surprisingly, the, the only babyface team in the match, DIY, are eliminated first, which you could say is questionable booking. You could also say it gives us a real chance to do what we've secretly wanted to for a while because they're so good and really cheer on the revival against the AOP. And they go down swinging. They don't win the match, but they do give it a very good go. This match's format is so far removed from anything that a team like the Brainbusters or the Midnight Express would have found themselves doing, with the possible exception of war games, I suppose. But this was really updated for the modern audience. And the thing I mentioned about uh, the Revival wrestling like those old tag teams, wrestling like if wrestling was real and this is how they're going about winning the match. They've really managed to do that in a much more challenging, complicated, modern context. And now on to my final point, and I'm going to sound really... Ooh, look at me, I'm so academic. Uh, so we've talked about the modern and how FTR excel in the modern, but guys... What about the postmodern? That's the worst thing I've ever said. We get on to point number five, which is FTR's self-awareness. 
When FTR made the jump from WWE to AEW, the circumstances changed a little bit. They were no longer a great tag team. They were a great tag team hell-bent on proving how great a tag team they were and how great their style of tag team wrestling is. And you know, while you could argue that their initial entry into the company wasn't booked that well, perhaps there was that weird pseudo alignment with the Young Bucks and all the one-upmanship and the weird eight-man tag matches, I did start to enjoy it when they got in Hangman Page's head and then used that to take the tag titles from Omega and Hangman. And then we get to the big dream match. This is where the self-awareness comes in. This is a very meta match because not only is it a meeting between two of the greatest kayfabe tag teams around, it's a meeting of the two tag teams that everybody in the world is split on. Everybody prefers one or the other. You can probably guess which one I prefer, but I like the Bucks as well. And while I do think that the decision was wrong and that FTR should have won that match, and I'm holding on hope that they will beat the Bucks at some point in the future, I still thought it was a brilliant contest. Uh, and it really did help get across the, the fact that FTR are so in tune with the audience because they're self-aware. They know what we expect and what we want them to do. Jake St. Pierre of 411 Mania made a really good point in his review of this event. Uh, this came after the Young Bucks were hitting moves by the Hardys and the Dudleys. Great tag team innovators in the Attitude Era when everything was changing. And in return, FTR hit moves by the likes of Power and Glory and the Heart Foundation, real traditionalists. And in both tag teams doing this, they are fulfilling the roles that we have set for them in our minds. And to watch in a match, <clears throat> excuse me, that feels incredibly satisfying. And then in another incredibly meta moment, uh, FTR decide to use DIY's finisher. They do the meet in the middle and everyone comes off their seats because it's them acknowledging, yes, Remember that great tag team in that other promotion? That was us, and we are not afraid for a second to mention it here. And then of course, there's the big finish where Cash Wheeler goes for a 450 cent on, very out of character, which shows that basically you can't answer the question of which team's style is better. Um, but once one of those teams decides to stray outside of those kayfabe parameters, it spells disaster for them. Cash is very arrogant. He goes for that move. He betrays basically the essence of FTR, as stupid as that sounds, and he pays the price for it. And his team lose the match and they lose the titles. Usually at this point in the video, once we've done our five points, I do a bit of a neat outro, summing everything up and saying, this is why they're so good in the end. Um, I couldn't really think of what to write for this one because it's FTR, man. <laughs> they're so good. They're just so good. And I can't think of a way to sum it up. So just, you know, hopefully in the video, you've realized how good FTR are. Um, don't know what else to say. Bloody FTR while they like, eh?